So what we're about to be talking about in the next series of videos is going to be physiology, right? Which is very large, complex, uh, encompassing multiple disciplines, right? Physiology takes physics, biochemistry, cell biology, and all these things together and just puts them up into this nice whole systems frame of thought. And that's great, but uh, it's really important that everybody be on the same page for that when we're moving into this stuff. So I'm going to try to incorporate some videos from my uh, biochemistry playlists into this, maybe some from my immunology, and maybe some from, the, I think I've already made some on, on the nervous systems, but I may need to redo those for specifically with this text. But anyways, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page uh, before we move in. And this is really going to be mostly a review of everything that you probably already learned in general biology. And so, you know, feel free to skip it if if it isn't, I hope none of this information that I'm presenting should be new information for you. Um, so with that being said, let's get into this. So uh, before I start talking about this, uh, physiology is based off of basically the concept that an organism is dependent upon his organ systems. And the organ systems are dependent upon the organs. And the organs are dependent upon the tissues. And the tissue is dependent upon the cell. And the cell is dependent upon the gene expression uh, that it chooses to have at that specific time, right? The, the, your neurons are not producing the same type of proteins as your skin cells, right? So the good place to start for talking about uh, physiology is, is from the inside, from the small to the large, or from the large to the small, and I'm going to start from the small to the large. So the central dogma of biology revolves around just that thing, that gene expression, right? And it states that DNA is used to make RNA, and that RNA is used to make protein. The process of going from DNA to RNA, as I'm hopefully you're familiarized with, is known as transcription. Um, and the process of going from RNA to protein is called translation. The reason why this is a helpful thing, and the reason why I'm talking about this at the very beginning is, is that this is a linear, one-dimensional approach to biology. Obviously, it's not that simple, but it's very easy pedagogically, I think, to take complex things that are multidimensional, break them down into one dimension, and then build around that one dimension uh, later, rather than trying to learn 10,000 things all at once. And so that's why a lot of people talk about the central dogma of molecular biology. Um, and it also, I think, kind of shows the gaps that we can bridge between DNA and protein, and that's RNA. And if you remember from general biology, there are multiple different types of RNAs that do multiple different jobs. And RNA is structurally and functionally the bridge between DNA and protein. So RNA can act like DNA in that it can carry genetic information from one point to the next. Uh, but it can also act like proteins and that it can fold into these three-dimensional, you know, ribozymes and other things like that that we're going to learn about later. But for the purposes of this, that's something that we need to just address. Um, so the nucleus structurally, right here, is uh, made up of a nuclear envelope, which is a double phospholipid bilayer with nuclear pore complexes. These are just channels that allow who comes in and what comes out. If it's a phospholipid bilayer, that should tell you that it has that whole nonpolar polar ends to it. I'm not gonna do a full 100% review of general biology just because we don't have time for that. The nuclear lamina is also part of this. This is the rough, dense protein filament uh, type of structure underlying it. And if it's meant to provide structural support, you wanna have a really strong protein mostly keratin would be the one to do the job. Actually, long after the cell is dead, you can still see the nuclear lamina in place. It takes a long time for that thing to degrade away. Um, whenever we stain the nucleus, we see something, uh, this unique site called the nucleolus, and this is the site of ribosome assembly. So this is where we're gonna take the large and small uh, subunits of a ribosome and combine that with the ribosomal RNA to have a full functional ribosome that's gonna be exported out of the cell through the nuclear pore complexes to go on and do whatever it is that they're supposed to do. DNA can exist in really two forms, you could say. Um, this is oversimplifying, I know, but chromatin and then chromosomes. So chromatin is a loose DNA that's readily reactive, it's being transcribed to make proteins and it's doing all that stuff. And then chromosomes are DNA that's wrapped up around a protein called a histone, and this is something that's useful when we're trying to divide a cell from one point to the next. Okay, so here's a picture just detailing everything that I talked about. This is the nucleus here, nucleolus right here, and kind of circling that in gold, that darker area there for ribosomal assembly. Uh, this is the chromatin, as you can see in this little purple string. They did a good job of making that look uh, not very clear because chromatin, to my understanding, doesn't even show up uh, upon staining of any type of microscopes that I know of. Um, maybe for certain types of dyes, but that's beyond the point. Anyways, the nuclear envelope it has an inner membrane and an outer membrane, and then the nuclear pores that you can see here on this structure here, 
And then down here is a picture, should not have used yellow for that. Down here is a picture of the pore complex, which is that channel that allows things to moving in. And lo and behold, what are they dealing with trafficking? Ah, a ribosome. That's, that's useful, isn't it? Okay, so down here in this mesh kind of looking structure here, that's the, the filamentous uh, structure of those proteins. In this case, it's the nuclear lamina. And down here you can see a real quick distinction between the chromatin, which is what you see over kind of on the left, as opposed to this wrapped up thing here. This would be a chromosome. All right, so moving along, just keeping up with the theme of the central dogma of molecular biology, let's talk about ribosomes, which is the site of translation, or the guys that are doing translation. Uh, and they're structurally made up of two parts, obviously, a protein and then an RNA. Uh, and that RNA is called the rRNA, which stands for ribosomal RNA, and then a large subunit and a small subunit. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that in terms of how that stuff is oriented. It's not like it's just three parts. They're all kind of mixed together. But they come to look like this little sandwich thing over here that you'll see. There's the large subunit and then there's the small subunit down there. In human beings, they tend to be around 80 Svedbergs. Svedberg is just a unit of density that we have, but what I want you to understand is that they're structurally unique. They're not the same thing structurally as what you'd see in uh, a bacteria, for example. And their function is to produce proteins, obviously, and there's two types of ribosomes we're going to have. There's free-floating ones that are in the cytosol, just floating around all willy-nilly, and they make proteins for the inside of the cell, proteins that the cell needs to use. And then there's bound ribosomes, ribosomes that are bound to some type of a phospholipid or some type of a membrane, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, for example, or something like that, that are going to be either A, excreted by the cell, okay, it's like, a, like insulin being secreted by the cell, or two, being embedded into the membrane like a like a identifying like a protein tag or something like that. Kind of switching gears now, we're going to talk about the endomembrane system. And what I want you to know about the endomembrane system is that all the parts of the endomembrane system are either physically connected continuously uh, or they're connected by sending vesicles back and forth. And this has a lot of significances in terms of evolutionary biology, but for now we're just gonna list their, the parts of them and then we'll explain what they do as we go along. Okay, for the endoplasmic reticulum, there's two types. There's the rough ER and then there's the smooth ER. And the rough ER is called that because it's studded, it's rough, with bound ribosomes. So if it's studded with ribosomes, then chances are in ribosomes job is production of proteins, then we're gonna make proteins that are gonna be used for secretion or that are going to be embedded into the cell membrane. Some people call the, the rough ER the membrane architect and I kind of like that description because if you look at all of the wonderful glycoproteins that they use to identify a cell, that came from initially the rough ER. But there's also the smooth ER and the smooth ER is not studded with bound ribosomes and its function is mostly in detoxifying the cell. Cytochrome P450 is a very good example of an enzyme that you could find in there. Uh, it synthesizes lipid compounds such as steroid hormones uh, so estrogen, testosterone, things like that, those are where you'd find that stuff. And it also plays a role in calcium storage, which is really important in terms of physiology when we start talking about the neurons and the muscle uh, functionality of between those two. This is the Golgi body. I think the analogy that people give of that is that they're kind of like FedEx of the cell. If you look at what FedEx is doing, it's shipping, packaging, and receiving the thing you bought on Amazon. Well, in this case, the Golgi bodies are involved with shipping, packaging, and receiving the proteins of the cell. And so what is it made up structurally? Well, it's made up of a membrane here, which is folded up into these things called cisternae. And the reason why this is a good thing, a reason why this is an advantageous thing structurally is that one, each and every one of these shelves that you can see here, so for example, I'll draw this one here in, in purple and then uh, gold or white. So those two guys there each have different sets of enzymes that are involved in doing different types of chemical reactions or chemical modifications to the protein. So that's the first advantage is that you can separate these things out, the reactions out physically. But the second advantage is, and this is just a general trend in biology, is anytime you can get the same job done with taking up less space, chances are that that's gonna be an advantageous thing here. So that's why a lot of these things, anytime you see cisterna, I want you to think, ah, maximizing the job we have to do by taking up less space, because cells are really dense. There's a directionality to the Golgi bodies. The cis end is what's located near the endoplasmic reticulum here. So this would be the cis, the receiving end of it. And then the trans end is located away from the endoplasmic reticulum. So the trans is the shipping side. Um, the functions of it is to chemically modify the protein, right? So we're going to add or remove a sugar here, add or remove a phosphate there, depending on what we need to do specifically. And these modifications tell it 
that we add to it tell and determine a little bit where it's going to go. Is it going to be embedded in the membrane? Is it going to be excreted uh, from the cell? Just the context really matters with this. But as long as you understand that, you should be okay. And the next is the lysosome. And uh, the structure of a lysosome is just a vesicle containing hydrolytic enzymes, and they tend to have an optimal pH of around, I think, three or four, so acidic conditions, kind of like your, your digestive system or like your stomach, if you could think about it. Uh, it's created by the Golgi bodies, which is really interesting in that they're one of the few things that the Golgi bodies make that isn't embedded in the membrane that actually stays within the cell because it's a part of the endomembrane system. And its function is two things. One of them is digestion, obviously, through the process of phagocytosis. So here's a picture of phagocytosis happening. The lysosome is going to fuse with the endosome, forming a phagolysosome. It's going to break down whatever the cell just clumped up, be it food or or a bacteria or whatever, depending on the context, right? But the other thing that it does is recycling. Uh, molecules that are from damaged or non-functional organelles, this is a process called autophagy, and it's really well personified in the case of Tay-Sachs disease. So in Tay-Sachs disease, for one reason or another, a protein that are involved in functioning within the lysosome isn't present, and it's because it's been mutated. And this mutation causes the lysosomes basically not to be able to do their job. And so certain types of biomolecules, such as lipids, are going to build up in excess within the lysosomes, and they're not going to be able to be fully broken down. And systemically speaking, this causes a lot of oxidative stress, but with Tay-Sachs, they'll actually get placking buildup in their brain, and, and it, it's usually kind of a slow neurodegenerative disease. And so, yeah, this picture over here on the right just shows autophagy happening. Here's a, I think it's a mitochondrion. Let's say this mitochondrion isn't doing its job anymore. It's been damaged. It makes sense given the role that they play. And we want to break down that mitochondrion and use the biomolecules in it that are still useful. And so that's what the lysosome will do through the process of autophagy. Okay, next is the mitochondria, which, as you know, functions with ATP production. It's a small bacterial-sized series of membranes with cisternae right? And it contains an internal matrix as well. So this, and this picture really doesn't do it justice, but if you could see right here, there's that little infolding there, that would be the cisternae, and then there's an open part of it, which is the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, and the matrix is where kind of more open, kind of cyclic reactions happen, like the Krebs cycle, um, and, and that's where a lot of that is going to be taking place. Its functional role, as I said, is to produce ATP through a long series of chemical reactions. Ultimately, this is an electron transport type of reactions. I'm not going to really go in too much into the evolutionary biology behind it, but it's very interesting. It's an endosymbiont, which means that it has its own unique DNA, its own circular chromosomes, if you could call it there, uh, ribosomes, and its own division cycle. So, for example, the mitochondria will divide when the cell doesn't divide, or you could say that the cell is dividing when mitochondria aren't dividing. But however way you want to look at it, they are endosymbionts, and they're not part of the endomembrane system because they did not come from that series of infoldings. They are former bacteria. Next one is the peroxisomes. Uh, again, not part of the endomembrane system. Structurally, they are a vesicle containing lots of redox reaction enzymes. For example, catalase or superoxide dismutase. I'm going to talk much more about this stuff when I think we talk about reactive oxygen species. They get their own little uh, chapter. But for reference, superoxide dismutase takes highly reactive superoxide and, and reacts it with, I think, and hydrogen, or you could say hydronium, regardless of whatever context you want to think about it, converts it into hydrogen peroxide, whereas catalase is going to take hydrogen peroxide and convert it into good old-fashioned water and diatomic oxygen. Its function pretty much is any type of reaction that involves uh, oxidation within a cell, peroxisomes are going to be involved in that. One notable example is beta oxidation, and this is the process by which your cells will take fat and break it down into a form that the mitochondria can use to make ATP. Okay, so shifting gears, the next thing we're going to talk about is the cytoskeleton. And what's important about the cytoskeleton, that's an O by the way, <laughs> the cytoskeleton plays a large role in determining the cell's morphology, its shape, right? And that's really important uh, playing along with the theme of physiology is that the structure determines the function, right? So there's three of them that we're going to mention, the microtubules, the microfilaments, and then the intermediate filaments. Um, don't worry too much about the diameter. I have a hard time visualizing nanometers, and I don't think anybody can really visualize nanometers in terms of size, but anyways, microtubules are the largest one of the three, even though they're called microtubules, which I've always hated that name. But the hollow tubes, basically, consisting of a protein called tubulin that exists in a dimer of both alpha and then beta tubulin. And this has a lot of functional roles within the cell. It, what you need to really know is that it resists compression. Hopefully you can see that. But it resists compression 
and it plays a large role in cell movement. So both intracellular movement and extracellular movement. So if I want to move, for example, a vesicle or an organelle or a chromosome from one end of the cell to the other, I'm going to be using microtubules. But if I also want to move the cell itself, like a sperm cell, or if I want to move something around a cell, I will be using microtubules in that process through the use of things called cilia or flagella, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Microfilaments are made up of a protein called actin, and what's important for this is one, it plays a huge role in resisting tension, and then two, it's contractile. And so if it's contractile, it's going to play a role in a lot of processes such as cellular motility, amoeboid motion, or also the cleavage furrow whenever we're talking about uh, cytokinesis happening, and a bunch of other things that I'm going to mention on later. Intermediate filaments are very thick, strong, fibrous proteins made up of keratin. We've already kind of talked about that. And what they do is they play, again, a role in tension. So the only one of these that plays a role in resisting comp compression is the microtubules. The microfilaments and intermediate filaments, mostly keratin, play a role in resisting tension. Um, we've already talked about its role in terms of the uh, nuclear lamina. It sometimes will anchor organelles into their certain places there. Very, very strong protein, keratin, right? You know how they say that your fingernails uh, and hair keep growing after you're dead? Well, they don't. It's just that keratin takes a very long time to break down, and that's what your fingernails and your hair are made out of. And so after your body is pretty much decomposed, it, those, those things will still be there. Uh, an analogy that people make is that the microtubule is kind of like the highway of the cell, and that if I wanted to send a vesicle, for example, say from, I don't know, the mitochondria to the nucleus, I'd have to send that vesicle along a microtubule. And that's what this picture here is showing you. So you can see these little kinesin proteins here. These are motor proteins that are hydrolyzing ATP and literally like walking one foot at a time along this microtubule. And so there's two ends of this. There's this depolymerizing end and then there's the polymerizing end. And it's kind of interesting because like as this guy is walking, this stuff is getting broken down and this stuff is getting put back together on this end there. They're not static structures, right? We're breaking down the microtubules, we're rebuilding them in certain areas. It's a very, very, very dynamic process here. It regulates this, or where a lot of the tubulin proteins are kind of stored, if you can think about it, is in this something called the centrosome. And the centrosome is made up of centrioles, and then the centrioles are made up of microtubules. And so we just talked about the intracellular movement with the kinesin proteins, but these are talking about the extracellular movement. And both of them are made up of a nine by two uh, microtubule pattern, which I'll explain later, but the cilia play a role with what's called crowd surfing is what I like to call it, or you can think of it as a beating pattern, whereas flagella are the classical whipping tail, so like kind of the tail that whips that propels the sperm forward, kind of like a mermaid, and then the crowd surfing, if you can imagine, if you've ever done crowd surfing, cells basically do that thing where they stick their hands up and then they will actually carry something from one end to the other, so this would be like, for example, if you've ever done that. There's a person there, and these guys are going to carry him from there, and there's going to be some other people along the line that will be able to carry him from one point to the next. An example of where this is, is kind of gross, is in the trachea of your respiratory tract or the fallopian tubes. We'll talk about examples of it later. Anything that's really, really big that stands out of a cell that sticks up is a really good point for signaling, right? So there's sometimes called the primary cilium, which is an immovable signal antenna, which plays a large role in receiving signals for certain types of development. That's not really important that you, you know that, that's just kind of like a fun fact. But the, it's important that you understand is the structural arrangement of each of these. So at the base of both a cilia or a flagella is a basal body. And a basal body is a nine by zero pattern of microtubules at the base of each of these. And what's interesting about this is that basal bodies are structurally very, very similar to the centrosomes. And when a sperm fuses with an egg, it's actually going to bring with it and donate to that egg the centrosome, which is going to start the whole process of cell division. Both the cilia and the flagella use a unique type of motor protein called a dynein. And I think I'm going to have a picture on the next slide, yeah, that's going to illustrate that process here. So without the use of a uh, cross-linking attachment anchor protein, when a dynein contracts, it moves the microtubules along, kind of similar to what we saw with kinesin. But when there's a anchoring protein involved with that, a contraction of the dynein causes the cilia, or in this case the flagella, to kind of bend, to bend back and forth through a series of contraction and relaxation. And that's how we can move things from one point to the next. For example, the tail end of a sperm, or again, the cilia propelling things up your respiratory tract. Okay, so this is a picture here that shows that 9 by 2 versus a 9 by 0 cross pattern that I was telling you about. If you look at here, these are doublets of microtubules, but there's a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, nine of them with two in the center, and this is in the actual part that's functioning as a cilia or functioning as a flagella. 
And then at the base of that, though, is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine series of triplets with nothing at the center. Here. And so that's why we say 9 versus 0 versus 9 by 2 pattern there. So here's a slide that just shows pictures of all the things that microfilaments are involved with. Um, obviously, if they're contractile, they play a role in muscle contraction, but not just muscle contraction, but the actual division of two cells uh, during cytokinesis right after we've done mitosis, formation of that cleavage furrow that should all be reviewed for you. Um, if you were to look at this picture here down uh, this corner here, this is the inside of a cell. This would be the outside of the cell. This kind of, I think, orange color here. This is sometimes called the cortex. And the reason why that's significant, aside from obviously structural support of the cell, is that when a cell wants to move, like a white blood cell chasing after a bacteria, or if a cell wants to phagocytize something, it's going to form little actin filaments that are going to actually push on the cell, kind of like a hamster in a ball, if you could imagine it. Uh, and that's what this picture over here is kind of highlighting. These extending pseudopodium or pseudopodia are going to push out and that's going to move the cell forward in amoeboid motion or they can push out and engulf something if we're going to do endocytosis. And don't worry about this picture down here. That's something with plants and this, this is physiology. We don't care about plants. Um, Okay, so moving on to cell junctions, there's three types of these, and there's just connections that you can have between one cell to the next. Um, the first one is tight junctions. These are very, very strong connections between the two. Uh, they're made up of thick protein filaments there. And this is really useful if any type of situation where you don't want two types of cells to mix. For example, if your blood were to mix with your brain, your own white blood cells in your blood would mount an attack on your brain because they would recognize that brain as a foreigner. Um, same thing with the testicles if you're a guy, uh, which is why some people can become sterile after a vasectomy, even if they reverse it. But anyways, tight junctions here, impermeable junctions preventing molecules from passing through the intracellular spaces. Next one is called the desmosomes. Um, and these are kind of like a, a rivet, if you can think of it, or something that's called spot welds, or I think the analogy is also Velcro, Velcro in this case. They're really, really flexible. So what they have here on the outside is obviously keratin, keratin being really, really strong. And then on the inside is a linker protein. In this case, it's cadherin is the, the name of the protein, but that's not really important. It's a glycoprotein that sticks together, what do you do? But it's important for lots of reasons. So for example, it, the heart muscle, if the heart muscle cell were to contract right now, if the heart as a whole organ were to contract, it has to be able to do that without tearing itself apart. And the strong flexibility of desmosomes is what enables it to do that. And the third kind, which plays a role not just uh, in terms of, of junctions between the heart, but also in, in the nervous system and other things we'll talk about later, is called the gap junctions. And these things are made up of connexons, which are just basically two single channels made of connexin, wonderful name, that help form a connection from one cell to the next. So in this case, let's say that we had, I don't know, say sodium, for example, could go from one cell directly to the next through these gap junctions. So anytime we have some type of electrical current going on or some type of ion conductivity going on, you're gonna see gap junctions there. Okay, so for vesicular transport, there's three kinds. There's endocytosis and exocytosis. Those are really the primary ones, but there's also a process of transcytosis, which I'll talk about last. Endocytosis, as its name implies, is just the process of taking something into the cell. It's kind of an ambiguous term. Sometimes, though, it can be used synonymously with pinocytosis, which is the process of taking in fluid, cell drinking, or phagocytosis, which is the process of cell eating. This may or may not be receptor mediated. It may be specific or it may be nonspecific, just depends on the context. But this process pinches off a piece of the phospholipids from the cell membrane. So they're removing from the cell membrane and forming a vesicle that's inside the cell. And by extension, once we do this, let's say that we have some type of a chemical reaction. Let's say that we do phagocytosis, okay? We eat something, we digest it, and then we need to excrete it from the cell. Well, we're going to do the process of exocytosis, which is where we're removing something from the cell. And again, this process may or may not be receptor-mediated, and it's always used to either A, remove waste from the cell, such as with the example of phagocytosis, or B, to secrete some type of a signal molecule, usually a protein, say, I don't know, a cytokine, for example. And this process adds a phospholipid to the cell membrane. So exocytosis increases the cell membrane and endocytosis decreases the cell membrane. And on the subject of when we were talking about whether or not it is receptor mediated, this receptor that's involved with that is called the snare hypothesis. And the reason why I'm showing this is that it's one, it's an extra step in the process there. And anytime you have more steps in a process, the more you can control it and the more that you can regulate it. And two, it's really important because 
the botulism toxin is thought to inhibit the snare proteins from interacting with each other, and that inhibits, obviously, the exocytosis of a neurotransmitter in this case, but also other things as well. This is just a picture here showing endocytosis, in this case, the form of pinocytosis, bringing in a fluid here, and then phagocytosis. In this case, they're showing that phagocytosis is receptor-mediated, which you may want to make note of is that they're forming pseudopodia to engulf this item that they're going to phagocytize, which is, hopefully, if you can remember, through the use of actin filaments, right? Yes. Okay, and then transcytosis is a little bit different because in transcytosis is where something goes into the cell and then actually leaves that cell without any type of chemical reaction or any modification happening to it. So, okay, so time for some review questions. Um, this one's going to be, uh, which of the following best explains why alcohol or chronic alcoholism, I should have said that instead of alcohol addiction, uh, but why does it in men tend to present with testicular atrophy and then gynecomastia? So testicular atrophy, what I mean by that is that the testicles shrink. And remember that the testicles synthesize steroid hormones, all right? So testosterone, lipid-soluble hormones, right? And then gynecomastia is the development of breast tissue in men. Pause the video if you need to. Think about it. Okay. The answer to this question was C, because the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is overwhelmed with detoxifying the alcohol that it cannot synthesize testosterone states that some antibiotics work by inhibiting the ribosomes of bacteria. Which of the following best explains why a human can take an antibiotic without any negative effects? So pause the video if you need to. Okay, the answer to this one is D, both A and E. So the ribosomes of bacteria do have different ribosomal RNA than we do, and then the ribosomes of human have different size and different structure. All right, so this question asks that the blood-brain barrier prevents systemic blood circulation from reaching the central nervous system. Which junction most likely explains why nervous tissue and blood never directly mix? So again, pause the video if you need to. Okay, the answer to that is C, the tight junctions. Hopefully that was, that shouldn't have been too, too difficult. Okay, next question is that a fatty liver is the accumulation of triglycerides and other fats in the liver cells. The amount of fatty acid in the liver depends on the balance between the process of delivery, removal, and recycling. Which cellular organelle should a researcher want to focus on for studying fatty liver and why? So again, pause the video if you need to. Okay, and the answer to that is C, the lysosomes. Hopefully this word recycling kind of gave it away. The last question that I'm going to ask is, all the following are part of the cytoskeleton except D. There is no such thing as a protein called myokin. 